Okay, so hi everybody. This is Matt uh, Matt Schultz from Educopia. Um, we're still a minute or so before the top of the hour, so we'll give everybody a chance to get signed in. I'm going to go ahead and throw our notes and agenda into the chat for everybody. And if I can have at least one person confirm for me that they can get in there and make edits, I'm seeing some folks list their attendance already. So that's promising. Everybody on the call can feel free to go ahead and get their name on that attendance list. Everybody's also being good doobies, keeping their mics muted um, as we head into the presentation today. Thanks for doing that. Great. Okay, and I think we're just gonna give folks a minute or so yet uh, to get on and then we'll get started here. Um, folks should know uh, Leah Prescott uh, from Georgetown Law Library. Um, she's co-chair with me for this interest group. Um, she's not gonna be able to make it to today's call. Um, she's dealing with a whole lot there on her end, trying to get everybody remote access to resources. Um, given a lot of the, uh, the, the closures that we're all experiencing. Um, just to, and folks can feel free just briefly at the top of the hour here if they've got some things they wanna throw in and, and vent about, um, uh, you're welcome to unmute your mics. Uh, just a call out to everybody. How's everybody holding up out there? Any horror stories that folks wanna report? You can throw those in the chat too if you'd like. Feel free to use a little bit of this space to uh, to vent through some of the adjustments that we're all making. Hope everybody's hanging in there. Back at you, Matt. Yeah, is that Courtney? Yeah, hey, Courtney. Hi. <clears throat> I, uh, it was, uh, we had our uh, coordinating, or the, the leadership team meeting for NDSA last, uh, last week, Thursday, and everybody was already, f most of the folks who showed up uh, for that call were, were pretty transitioned to calling in from the home front and I saw lots of cats and dogs. Um, so expect to see a lot more of that in the, the weeks to come. <laughs> Everybody's home quarantine, self quarantining with their pets. It'll be an interesting test of uh, Zoom's capacity. Yes. There'll be a lot more Zoom sessions across the board. Yeah, about a week or so ago, they probably had some severe bug out moments, the team there at Zoom. <laughs> at Zoom. <laughs> Um, just uh, preparing for what's coming here. <laughs> there we go. That says it all. Nice little meow on the line. Okay, well, so we uh, we are recording um, and we have a really good quorum. Uh, we're a couple minutes after the top of the hour here, so I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, uh, we are going to be hearing uh, this week from uh, Nathan Tallman, our uh, intrepid uh, previous uh, co-chair, along with Corey Davis in the last iteration of the Infrastructure Interest Group. So Corey doesn't, or uh, Nathan doesn't need too much of an introduction uh, here, but uh, we'll have him say a little bit about uh, himself uh, and uh, his affiliation there at Penn State and the work that he does uh, as we get started here for folks who maybe are um, uh, just joining uh, the Infrastructure Interest Group. Uh, I don't have a whole lot of, in the way of admin updates, uh, except to say that uh, we, so Carol Kussman's on the line here. Um, she's heading up the new coordinate, uh, the communications group uh, within NDSA and they're doing, uh, along with Nathan, uh, a whole bunch of work on the, the websites. And so we will be giving them some updated information on the, um, the working charge and agenda for this uh, interest group. Uh, after today's call, um, they're on a fast track to get some information tidied up on our websites and communicated about um, about all of the interest groups. Um, so just know that that's uh, that's at work in the background on behalf of this interest group. Uh, and folks can ex expect to see some things going out in the next week or two on that front. Uh, Nathan and Carol and all the other folks who are working on the communication side of things for NDSA, um, thanks for all the work that, that you do there. Um, we can touch on the, uh, the schedule for what's ahead in terms of topics uh, after we hear from, from Nathan, um, but really want to just go ahead and dive in. And Nathan, it looks like you're all set up to go there. This is a topic that's been uh, on the radar for this interest group for some time now, um, trickled to the top of the poll that uh, was taken uh, before we launched this year's iteration of the interest group. Um, so this is, this is a, a topic that's been in high demand. and. 
um, really appreciate Nathan you taking the time to put this together for us and um, I think it'll be pretty fresh and a lot of us are you know just kind of wondering what's all loaded into this this concept of software defined storage so um, I'll turn it over to you and folks can you know queue up questions in the chat along the way we'll save some time for some questions at the end um, and let's get started. Good morning. Um, so I'm, uh, as Matt said, Nathan Tallman, um, Digital Preservation Librarian at Penn State. Um, uh, Nada has Matt. Um, you'll notice I'm sort of using an experimental uh, feature of PowerPoint to do live captioning and it's a bit hit or miss. Um, but feedback on whether it was distracting or useful or worthless because it said things like hazmat when it shouldn't have um, would be good uh, if, if folks have thoughts on that after the presentation. Um, and uh, also am working from, from home like many of you probably are, um, so you might see a dog or a cat or hear them, um, probably more likely hear them when something will set off the dogs. So I'll try to mute quickly as, as possible. Um, so this presentation, um, one, I was trying to pull together a panel of some folks, but um, wasn't able to make that happen in time and get the commitments. Um, and more so comes from some research I'm doing um, as opposed to things that we are doing in a production fashion at Penn State. Um, but why don't we sort of dive in. Um, so what is software-defined storage and why should anybody care? Um, one of the, the things I'm working on in sort of my research line is uh, what are some practices and, and uh, techniques that are occurring in sort of the commercial sector of digital that we can use in the library sector? Um, that, you know, a lot of the sort of uh, practices or techniques or, or approaches that we use for some of our core preservation activities are, are based in, um, came about sometime in the 90s usually, um, because we were the only sort of uh, group of people who were looking at these things in a hard way, um, were cultural heritage organizations. And so we invented our own um, ways to do things because there wasn't really an alternative. Um, flash forward um, into the current age, a lot of technology companies um, have these same problems and have solved them in different ways. And we probably can learn from those and not just to shoot them because, oh, they're commercial, they're, they're doing it for a different purpose. There's a little bit of that in there, but there's things that we can learn too to help make um, how we approach things more efficient um, and in the end, more sustainable from an economic front, but also from a, um, just the amount of labor it takes to do things so that we can preserve more. Um, so software-defined storage really is the backbone of the cloud. Um, software-defined storage has been used by the likes of Amazon and, and Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud, um, especially Backblaze. Um, they're all using some form of software-defined storage, and it's what makes their cloud storage prices so cheap. Um, it's it's a approach where you can have more, you know, what's termed sort of commodity hardware or cheaper hardware, so you don't need to necessarily buy um, the, the the fastest um, sealed helium sealed hard disk drives and SSDs for everything. Um, but that you can use good hardware, you know, you wouldn't necessarily want to use garbage hardware, but use cheap hardware, um, commodity hardware, and then software to provide an abstraction. Um, a, a, the software is what's managing the hardware. Um, and sort of through this software approach, you can um, really achieve some economies of scale um, and providing that data integrity using RAID-like approaches across that system. Um, it really also enables organizations to kind of create their own clouds or storage clouds at the very least, because um, software-defined storage would be part of a, a larger overall cloud that might also provide compute. Um, but using just software-defined storage, you could, you could uh, create private cloud storage, whether that's something that is available externally or just in, internal to your organization. Um, object storage like Amazon S3 
um, you can have that using software defined storage on your own uh, at your own institution or something that's available to you. And because it would be on premise, perhaps it also would be faster um, than some cloud storage might be. Um, it'd be better for things like edge computing, where you need to apply a lot of uh, processing techniques to that storage, to the content in that storage rather, um, where in the cloud model, it's often a walled garden where you have to have the content and the compute in the same place, um, all within the AWS, for example, to be able to leverage things economically without having to move the data around too much. From a technical sense, Software-defined storage uh, is, is, as I alluded to, it's an abstraction separating the underlying storage media, whether they're hard disks or um, uh, uh, solid state disks, um, M MVDME uh, sort of flash storage, um, or even in some ways you can do tape systems as well. Um, but it's between that storage media and then the systems um, that manage that hardware speak to the software-defined storage. Your software-defined storage speaks to your computer and how it, uh, those storage areas appear or interacted with and how they appear to the end user. Um, it's because of that abstraction, it's easier to use a diverse range of uh, storage media. You can refresh and replace and expand that media um, you can you just keep adding new nodes or server racks um, to that software defined storage instance um, and expand your storage out horizontally so you can scale out. Um, you can also provide storage through a number of protocols or access points. So file storage or file systems, this is what most of us think of when we think of storage because it's how most of our computers um, see and interact with hard disks. So we have a local hard disk, we have a flash drive, um, we might have network storage where it's files and we put the files in directories, we have file paths which um, help us find and address that content later on. Um, and these uh, drives, so to speak, these network storage areas, um, they take up certain uh, disk sectors somewhere. Um, so Sometimes in file storage, you, you might be using up more storage than you actually need because you have sort of extra padding depending on how that file is broken up across the disk sectors. Block storage um, is more often used for um, virtual servers when you are adding a local disk. So if I have a virtual server and I want to add um, some local hard drive capacity, uh, to that, to install my operating system, to install programs I need to use. You usually do that via block storage. These are sort of virtual hard disks. Um, VMDKs, if you've heard of them, um, that's a type of block storage where it's one file representing that entire block. Um, these have a sort of complex addressing or pathing using logical block addressing. It's not something that we as the end user typically um, sees. It's sort of within the system. Um, object storage, which might be more familiar, is, is the typical usage for the cloud, um, where you have these discrete blobs or packages or objects, depending on however they're called. I, I think of them as packages because one object could be one file, two files, three files, 100,000 files. Um, but there's sort of this grouping of files called an object. Um, it uses a URL or a URI to address and locate that object. You can have different properties associated with that object, like you would embedded metadata. Um, and you can have sort of uh, policy-driven um, actions that occur to those objects. Software-defined storage um, removes some of the dependencies for specific um, architectures and proprietary systems. So if you've ever used um, a NetApp storage appliance or an Isilon storage appliance, sometimes there's very specific, you know, Dell ECMC hardware that you have to get with that um, system. Um, Software-defined storage, generally you can, you know, use whatever type of hardware you have available or want to buy. You're not locked into any one particular type. So you can uh, expand out that storage or, or swap it out to something else. Some features for um, software-defined storage 
um, we have scalability. Um, so as I said, we can add new disks to this. We can add new nodes. We can add new clusters. Um, nodes clusters are sometimes defined a little differently. Generally, a, a node is sort of um, a location. So if we have um, a software-defined storage system that spans, let's say, um, University Park or State College, Pennsylvania, and Hershey, Pennsylvania, those would each be a node. So two nodes, sort of like distributed digital preservation, you have multiple nodes. A cluster is sort of um, a way to add capacity. You could think of a cluster as a server rack or a group of server racks at that particular node. So if I want to expand my um, storage capability, I could add more clusters to a node. So that could be a rack of new hard drives. Um, but this, the scalability, it's fairly easy to, to increase or, or scale down if that's what you need to. Um, if you're self-hosted, you don't need um, as many, if you're doing this local, this having sort of local open source and using your own systems administrators, you don't have to have uh, the same level of contracts um, and extra cost for maintenance agreements. Um, if you're use, approaching this for an open source software, um, well, I'll get to that a little bit later. Um, but in general, because you have this freedom and the separation of dependencies on particular software architectures or particular types of hardware, um, when you uh, are working with vendors, you sort of approach that contact a bit differently. And usually um, there's less wiggle room for these extra hidden costs that creep up. Um, flexibility, so you can provide any type of storage whether it is that file storage or block, block storage or object storage, um, it really gives you the, the flexibility you, that the file system storage, you can provide networks, uh, shares the same way many people probably use now, you stop that, as a place to um, put that content. Um, you can have that same content accessible you know, via multiple protocols as well. So if you need sort of server level access, um, if it's network storage, you could still do something like NFS um, or network file storage protocol could be accessed there. Or if it's a block storage, um, you could use an intermediate system to make that also available um, via SMB or NFS. Um, and you can really sort of architect this um, storage system to whatever your unique needs are. Um, if you have only one location and you can't have sort of a two location, two node model, or if it's not the same, you can do, you know, your nodes can be across the state, across the country, or across campus. You can um, set up sort of the hardware based on how you want to manage hardware dependencies and risks. So um, you could have all your hard drives from, you know, make sure that they're not all from one manufacturer, from one manufacturing batch. Um, you could be spreading out storage between hard disks, solid state disks, and tape. Um, so whatever your local constraints are for economics or for logistics as to where these things can go, or to what degree you can leverage cloud, software defined or objects, Software-defined storage gives you a lot of flexibility. Um, it's a fairly self-service um, system, and how you roll out self-service could really depend, again, on your local systems and what users are, are used to. Um, but a lot of things are managed via this web-based interface, um, and so you don't necessarily have to be going under the hood to the terminal um, to be making changes, to be adding new disks to the storage pools and clusters. Um, you can manage these things with a web-based interface. And so it doesn't necessarily um, have to be the storage systems engineer from your central computing center. It could be something in between. Um, and if you have a lot of needs for, for um, users to be able to create their own storage or um, manage these um, configurations themselves, then, then there would be some ability to let people um, usually sort of see just the, the things that they're, uh, they need to see in their dashboard in that web interface. Um, you can do a fair amount of automation with software-defined storage through policies, um, particularly with object storage, although you can approach it um, in other types of storage as well. 
um, where it might be, you know, this anything and this this sort of bucket um, for object storage is replicated out to these places, um, to these different nodes, or maybe to an external cloud. Um, and you also have a real standardized set of APIs for um, scripting and automating these sorts of activities. A lot of software defined storage systems, not all, but a lot sort of default to Amazon's S3 APIs, which makes it fairly easy to plug and play if you're already working in AWS. Um, the OpenStack set of APIs um, often works as the Swift, Swift API, um, usually are supported these as well. Um, and there are other um, APIs, and, and depending on the system that it might support. But that system itself will standardize these. So if you are building applications um, or systems that need to interact with your storage, it's not just a file system that you have to mount through um, NFS to that server from a block. You, you have a lot of ways to approach how this content is interacting with it. And you can sort of think outside some of the traditional limitations because these APIs give you flexibility in handling that content. So some things particularly related to digital preservation um, that uh, software-defined storage can help with. Data integrity. Um, so fixity, essentially, but a piece of fixity. Fixity is a very broad term that really has some subsets to it, and often those subsets are conflated into just one general concept of fixity. Um, but ways that software-defined storage helps with data integrity um, is through erasure coding, which is similar to how RAID works. Um, if you uh, think of how a, a RAID system, which is set up sort of in a group of hard drives, um, it sort of splits a file out into multiple chunks and stores them um, and multiple disks, and it uses a little extra bit of information uh, for parity, or which is how that file is reassembled. Um, so instead of doing this across just a small subset of hard drives like a RAID system would do, software-defined storage can do this across the entire system, um, whether it's splitting it, the one file, into multiple bits, you know, across every node or across all of the clusters in one node um, or between clouds even, um, although you wouldn't necessarily do that. Um, Software-defined storage can use non-cryptographic checksums to validate integrity of data aggregations. So that's a, let me unpack that. Um, we often perform fixity at the file level in digital preservation. And that gives us a very clean way to show that the file hasn't changed. And if we are using a cryptographic checksum, it gives us the ability to show that um, with the file is authentic to the way we received it in the system. Um, there are other ways to sort of verify, though, that a file hasn't changed that could save us in the long run a lot of CPU cycles across all of our content. So software-defined storage can validate uh, blocks or volumes, depending on how that particular system groups things. Um, it can sort of do fixity for a group of content or create a checksum for a group of content. And as long as that group of content hasn't changed and that checksum for that group of content doesn't change, then you can, uh, with fair certainty, you know, imply that there hasn't been a change of that content. That's a slightly different approach to the way that sort of fixity is handled for what you might call fixity at rest on file systems. Um, but there should be a way to, to document that and not have us compute every single file, particularly every single file at a SHA-512. Um, and speaking of that, it doesn't do away with the need to calculate things like a SHA-512 um, because you might need that SHA-512 to prove authenticity. You might need an MD5 um, if you're doing transactional fixity. Um, an MD5 is perfectly fine to use if you're just, you know, this file moved from A to B and I want to make sure I didn't lose any bits along the way. You don't need to use a 512 for that, SHA-512. An MD5 is fine. Um, so we can uh, 
software defined storage helps us particularly with that fixity at rest concept. Um, replication. So we have um, these, you know, object storage buckets. Um, I believe we can do this as well for, for some of the other types of storage, the block storage and file system storage. Um, but we can have these policies that um, have automatic replication. Um, so we can make sure we're getting some distribution and if depending on how our software defined storage network is set up, it might be sending it to a geographically distributed location in a different threat zone. It might send it to other clouds. So maybe I have one copy in my software defined storage system. I have one copy um, in a sister organization system because we're all using the same um, sort of software defined storage. We can all use similar APIs. Um, and we're also putting a copy maybe in um, Amazon and web services. So, but, but this all can be automated based on policies associated with that particular group of content. Um, we can self heal content if there's any damage, um, the same sort of way that, you know, Amazon now will, will guarantees 99.99999% of integrity. You know, those are a lot of um, uh, sort of mathematical calculations of risk. Um, but the, a lot of them deal with the number of chunks that are on those files and the, um, the way in which they are replicated out there. And they do self-healing, um, but you can also get, and this is important, transparency. So when a file does self-heal, you, you can be notified. You can have automatic sort of metadata added to that object, which can then be turned into something like premise. Um, in general, you can monitor and manage your usage and activities um, across that storage network at various levels of detail, which is helpful for planning um, and being able to predict and uh, project your storage costs. Um, in a lot of cloud storage, you know, it's really hard to calculate out what the pricing is going to be. You know, sometimes they have egress fees, sometimes they don't. You know, sometimes um, how often you access that content or need to do certain things with it changes the pricing. This just gives you a lot more ability to, to project and predict your pricing. Um, and hardware diversity is another great benefit for digital preservation because you can set up um, different storage you know, media, as I was saying before. We could have a batch of um, hard drive disks and you know, say we have four terabyte hard drive disks um, using um, you know, sort of an older building technology that doesn't have uh, helium sealed drives. So helium sealed drives are kind of the latest way right now to, to make hard disk drives and they provide um, quite a bit more reliability than other, um, a lot of the um, cheaper sort of hard disk drives that you might buy um, because there's less, um, there's a vacuum with that helium in there. Well, that doesn't make sense. Um, that's a different technology, apologize. But the helium, um, generally uh, doesn't let the platters, I think, move as much. So there's, there's less um, issues with, with bit drops or an actuator perhaps scratching the drive. But let's say we have those, right? And then, then we have some solid state drives and oh, now Seagate is releasing a new hammer, um, heat, a, a heat assisted magnetic recording device. So these can fit up to like 20 terabytes in a drive. We want to increase our capacity. We can swap all this out to be the latest and greatest that we can afford um, without necessarily having to do um, a lot of system migrations. We don't have to do new requisitions, you know, for um, a new storage vendor. Um, it gives that flexibility and your ability to define what is that hardware diversity underneath and how does that um, spread throughout your network. Um, so a, a sort of hypothetical um, distributed digital preservation model here using um, software defined storage. This is, you know, very, very simplistic, of course, and, um, you know, you might have other things acting on your content. So this is really a, an abstract hypothetical, but um, you might have a dashboard that sort of monitors the whole flow here, and you might have some of these other services, which aren't necessarily part of that software defined storage, um, but help you um, with the workflow aspect to it. So 
you have a dashboard that monitors everything and an ingest service so that uh, users have a predictable way to put content in and you can make sure you're getting checksums before it sort of goes into a system. Um, pushing that into your software defined storage system, you could be then spreading out those um, nodes. So here there's a Pennsylvania node, a Kansas node, a Nevada node, as well as a public cloud copy. Um, then there's might be a separate service for recovering or restoring those files if you need to pull them out. Um, certainly, there would be other aspects, you know, for your preservation management um, and sort of a robust production system that people are using um, to ensure that you have independence of copies. Perhaps you have um, one copy that isn't replicated by one of those, but instead you're, you're sort of using more traditional um, scripts to manage that process to separate out those. So if you have one bad copy, it doesn't overwrite all the good copies. Um, you'd probably have, you know, some other services in here as well. Um, but this is a, a very sort of simplistic view. Um, Software-defined storage really is powered by open source. Um, the sort of two uh, really predominant ones, options out there are known as Seth and Gluster. Um, they're both very reliable, um, and th they also have sort of different strengths. Um, and because these are open source, anyone's you know, free to use them and build out your own storage networks. Ceph is more often used as the base storage if you're building an entire cloud. So if you are gonna be building a whole cloud for storage, for um, compute, virtual servers, and container services with Kubernetes and Docker, you know, Ceph is probably the better option um, to have that underlying storage um, that gives you a lot of data integrity. Gluster um, is, scales a little easier than Ceph, um, and it works a little better for doing that sort of geographic distributed storage. So if you have one Gluster instance, you know, it could be tightly coupled with a, um, another instance at another data center, um, such that it's really viewed as one system. Um, so it's sort of better for building out these, these multi data center um, storage structures. You can do it with Ceph, but it's a little easier with Gluster and sort of scales out. Um, so both of these, you know, are, are, are good approaches, but depending on your particular needs, um, they, they might have different um, strengths for you. Ceph was um, started as a dissertation project and has been around, um, ah, sorry, my little speaker notes over here aren't going down. Um, but it's been around since um, I think around 2008, um, 2004, okay. So Ceph was started in 2004 as part of a doctoral dissertation. Um, it probably has a more active community these days than Gluster, but it's, it's widely used, uh, particularly associated with OpenStack. Um, Gluster, is um, started in 2005 as an independent project. It was acquired by Red Hat uh, around 2011. Red Hat still sort of drives the development of Gluster, although it is open source much the same way that they do Red Hat open source Linux. Um, Ceph is a little more um, community developed, whereas Gluster is a little more centrally developed, although they're both open source. And there are a lot of commercial providers out there, and these may or may not have Ceph or OpenStack under the hood, um, or as some layer, they might be using sort of proprietary approaches to software-defined storage. So I don't want to give the impression that software-defined storage is only an open source thing, um, but th there are some, some sort of proprietary approaches as well. But it's been on the uh, commercial sector for almost a decade, a little more than a decade. Um, there's a healthy market of vendors out there who provide this in an infrastructure as a service type manner or in a consulting for helping you build out your own local storage uh, systems. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to do these on premise. And you know, if you don't have a data center or a place to, to add server racks, um, there are many, many co-location data centers that you can rent space, um, rent a rack, um, and, and sort of have your equipment in there to have different nodes to give you that sort of geographic diversity, um, if that's what you're looking for. 
Um, so there are some risks, right? There's risks with everything and being digital preservationists, we should always be aware of what our risks are and have mitigation strategies in place for these. So um, given that software defined storage is a technical abstraction, um, this inherently increases software dependencies. So um, you need to make sure there's robust disaster management, um, disaster recovery for that SDS part of your infrastructure itself, that you can get that back up and back up and running. So whether that's a containerized service or whether it's distributed, um, much the same way the storage is, there's different ways to do that, but that does have a little uh, bit there. Um, systems administration can be a specialized skill set. Um, you could argue the same thing for proprietary storage systems in use today, um, that typically there's, you know, one or two people in the data center that knows how those systems run. Um, out of the way. Uh, it, it, I don't think it makes it too different. It's just a different skill set than we might have right now. Um, it is a little more niche perhaps. Um, but sort of the labor and staffing requirements to support certainly gets to the sustainability of any technology. So it's something to, to keep in mind. Um, independence of copies. I mentioned this earlier. Um, if you're just relying on those replication policies, particularly with an object storage, there is a risk there that you lose independence of those copies. Um, and independence of copies is a, is a concept to unpack another day. Um, but it's really the, the ability to which your, um, your copies know about each other and check in with each other and can be replaced by each other. So some ways to mitigate that, you know, is to put things in clouds that are managed through a different approach. So if you're putting a copy in a public cloud, you know, maybe it's a copy in Wasabi. Um, you have it in your system and software defined storage, you have it in um, a sort of maybe a sister organization where you have reciprocal storage agreements, you have a copy in Wasabi, right? Those are three different organizations managing that content. Um, so that provides you some independence. You could have it on sort of a local storage that is you know, separated from your software defined storage system. So maybe it's just an endpoint that you put stuff into um, and then monitor later on, but it's less integrated with that policy driven approach. Um, and this is a relatively new way to approach digital preservation. Um, you know, so it hasn't sort of stood that test of time. I would say, you know, has any digital preservation, excuse me, yeah, has any digital preservation system stood the test of time at this point? Um, but it is new and we're in the business of keeping the stuff around for a long time. So always to be approached with caution. Um, some of the novelty here associated with software defined storage, it's really only novel for, for cultural heritage organizations. As I said, this has been in use for a long time in that commercial sector. Um, it hasn't been widely tested for digital preservation use. So everything I'm telling you today, you know, is just sort of basic facts about software defined storage. There are very few, um, or at least publicly spoken about using it in a production fashion for digital preservation. Stanford is an exception. Stanford uses software defined storage in their infrastructure and Julian Morley has talked about that a few times. Um, he recently I think maybe even talked a little bit about that in this group here but in, in presentations he's made on cost modeling um, brings up the fact that they're using software defined storage and that, that by using that, it, it really significantly lowered their costs um, for preserving the content that they have. Um, it's sort of part of part of his presentation there. Um, so parts of what makes software defined storage or provide some of those features are really things that have been used in other areas, but software defined storage is just a bit of a new approach. That erasure coding, right? Essentially the same thing has been used um, in RAID setups, you know, within a smaller grouping of hard drives. Um, but it's sort of that same concept at a much larger scale. So there are other things like that where um, it's the components of the system, you know, aren't really that new when you look at them. It's just a new application, a new approach. Um, and software-defined storage, you know, 
really when it's a part of your overall infrastructure for digital preservation um, can really help bring efficiencies. It can help move things out of that top layer of infrastructure, that application layer, which is the most expensive. It's the most expensive, you know, to code, to logic, to sustain, um, you know, to have the expertise there. If that is moved down to that infrastructure level, you know, it's happening more natively in the system, right? Closer to that one and zero binary state. Um, so it's more efficient. It happens without as much compute. Um, we can save, save money and not over-engineer our digital preservation applications. We can learn from the commercial sector, um, which and sometimes we tend to be very hesitant about or tend to sort of like, oh, you know, they're doing it to make money. Well, yeah, because their, their ability to carry out, you know, that sort of distributed data storage with integrity um, can mean that they go out of business. Um, so perhaps there are some, some things to learn. Well, certainly we overlay our own long-term concerns for preservation as well. Okay, I haven't had a, chat, a chance to monitor the chat as that's going along, um, but that's throwing a lot at you. I'm sorry, um, I didn't have a panel here to make it a bit more interesting and it was just me yakking at you. Um, but I'll pause now and see if there are any, any questions in the crowd. Yeah, we are, uh, we are monitoring the chat. So folks can feel free, to, feel free to throw some questions in the chat or unmute your mics and, and have at it. So uh, Nathan, this is uh, this is Matt. Um, I'll ask a, a question real quick while maybe some folks are are formulating uh, some in the background here. Um, so, do you think that you can just sort of draw a little bit more of a finer point under you know why you think it would be worthwhile for um, you know our sector, um, particularly academic institutions, who are probably you know the most resource to to be able to dive into this most immediately? Why why we would take this approach as opposed to you know just um, relying solely on one or more commercial cloud providers who are already doing this? So um, this gives you local storage, a private cloud at public cloud prices. Mm -hmm. So it puts you in control of your data. Um, you know, it's not just service level agreements and uh, promises from vendor to make vendors to make sure that they you know, have it available at a certain time. Um, it puts the cultural heritage organizations in direct control, um, you know, to know who is looking at this content, who is able to read this content, you know, commercial storage providers in the analog realm have done some nefarious things with cultural heritage organization content in the past. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a way to sort of take ownership of that storage. Um, it, it's probably, um, can't, you know, this would need some more people to dig into, but um, I opine that it's gonna be more sustainable economically to be managing these, this um, sort of your own cloud storage, your own software defined storage network, um, then it will be to use the cloud over time. Um, the cloud storage pricing is kind of, in my opinion, building up technical debt for the future. Um, you know, you're, and the more you use any one particular cloud, the more you you sort of become locked in. Um, so it just, it helps hedge some bets, um, right? A, a cloud storage, um, commercial cloud storage is fine to be um, a part of your digital preservation infrastructure, but when the entire infrastructure is cloud-based and when that entire infrastructure is limited to one vendor, you're, you really have a lot of concentrated risk. Mm -hmm. um, and when we are in this business to provide access to future generations of researchers, you know, we really need to be careful about managing that, those risks. Yeah, that's great, thanks. There is no, you know, ready to go 
download and use it software defined storage digital preservation system. Um, you know, this is just uh, one piece that um, I'm hoping to, you know, eventually maybe do some some research with a partner um, on, you know, what is a prototype, you know, what might this look like in, in a practical system for, for doing digital preservation work. Um, but uh, there isn't that I know of um, something like that out there to test and to poke at. Um, so it's really sort of uh, a new a new approach, but I think it's incumbent upon us to find different ways to do digital preservation at this infrastructure level because you know it's just getting more and more expensive. Um, the more content we have, the more um, we systems that that need to be integrated. Um, if we keep doing everything to that sort of you know four three plus copies, SHA-512 checksums every 90 days on everything, um, it could get very expensive. And, you know, our, our yes, we need to apply appraisal to the content we're preserving, um, but it's going to reach a tipping point where, you know, our host parent organizations are just going to be like, no more, you know, we can't afford this. Um, so I think we really need to find some different approaches for these, these sort of core preservation activities and functions for bit level preservation. Mm -hmm. Robin's got a comment in the, the chat and, and you may or may not be able to speak to this. I know, I know you're, um, you're at the center of a lot of the, the work in AP Trust, but um, uh, she said, I wonder if AP Trust would be interested in prototyping this out. I, I, Think it would be interesting. Um, I think AP Trust right now is is you know trying to add a wasabi um, storage into the mix with Amazon. Um, it, it it could work potentially because they're using um, standard S3 APIs, but um, there sort of needs to be that infrastructure piece. Someone needs to have these systems up and running to to do the testing. But I think it'd be really interesting to try that. Um, in my, my view, this should be something of interest to that community of digital preservation service providers, um, you know, as a, as a new approach for, for doing some of this work that everyone could benefit from. Nathan, one of the things that I've been interested in for some time is <clears throat> down in West Virginia, because of the coal mine industry, they built like a huge data center with a big network pipe. And it just so happens that where that's located is very low risk because it's not at risk for tornadoes. It's not at risk for uh, many things. And the biodiversity there is higher because of that in some instances. Like they have more varieties of mud puppies than anywhere else. Go mm -hmm. figure. But, you know, if we could prototype this type of storage in that location as an alternative to the big vendors, I think it could have multiple positive things. Um, I haven't really checked in on that data center to see how full it is or, you know, what that looks like, but this is an interesting use case to explore. I, I agree. There's a lot of these sort of underground mines, you know, in Iron Mountain, right? They, they, that are um, used. There are data, other data centers under salt mines and, and things. Um, that generally have lower temperatures, so it's lower cost for all the HVAC to run those systems. Mm. Um, you know, and, and they are lower risk from these other areas. So I think they're they're really attractive to to use as storage locations. Um, all getting towards that you know sustainability aspect, um, but you know, I, it sounds really interesting. I'd love to be involved in, in some sort of testing out. Um, there's a data center in Indiana, and there's one in Pennsylvania too, which I think is a coal mine as well, um, that has these sort of co-location data centers. Um, well, the one, in, the one in Virginia is not in a coal mine, but it was something that was built to diversify, you know, business down in that area. Gotcha. And uh, it's on the other side of the Continental Divide. So for all the AP Trust members, it's far enough away and in a different geographic place that it would add a differentiation point for everyone except I think UNC. UNC is still within 175 miles of it. One thing that has been floated before, um, you know, is some sort of an idea of a, an academic cloud. 
Um, yeah. You know, and this could potentially be be the basis of a storage cloud that is you know run by academics or, or other glams, um, a nonprofit essentially, right? That doesn't have that commercial profit incentive by the storage provider. Um, you know, if we could get some institutions in you know maybe three or four or five states. Um, working together uh, at the, you know, sort of a national level, um, building out this type of infrastructure, I, I, I think there could be a lot of interest for people and, and perhaps, you know, stem some of the um, bleed to the cloud, so to speak. Yeah. Other, other questions? Nathan, you uh, you touched on it, but um, you, the you know sort of the gap that we have in terms of systems administration uh, expertise and capacity, you know, for doing this sort of work at our institutions and where that expertise is often you know sort of positioned, um, both in and out of the libraries. Um, um, so I wonder if you can speak a little bit to like how we pipeline uh, this professional development and expertise, you know, to the to the place where we feel like we could sustain um, these sorts of infrastructures longer term? Um, in some ways, I think it, it makes that a little easier um, because this, you know, sort of software defined storage has been sort of in the, the um, commercial sector for a while. Um, I think some of those system folks um, would be more versed in a general software defined storage approach than they would be to any one particular proprietary system or system that, that might be you know currently in use and um, salary just becomes the issue right <laughs> yeah yeah well, there's the, yeah all the competing priorities um you know but but it's tough to to generalize too much on that um you know because every organization and it um sort of uh, central IT data center build outs and things are, are, are going to be different. And, you know, some might never want to go for this. And so, um, you know, it would always be a challenge for that type of organization maybe to, to sustain this. But um, I, I would tend to think that this would, would actually increase, um, I'm sorry, decrease the, the risk of specialized systems knowledge, but it is just, something to be aware of that, you know, this isn't something necessarily um, that, you know, uh, someone walking in the door for the fresh out of college working in IT can, can necessarily take on, but maybe. Um, so I don't know if I'm adequately answering your, your question. Um, and I'm sorry, my cat keeps wandering in front of the camera. <laughs> no, it's good. No, I think I wonder if there's anyone, um, you know, on the call who, uh, who, who, you know, at their institution uh, gets in the classroom these days. And I, I know I can, um, rewinding back 10 years now to my time at high school, you know, we didn't, we didn't come anywhere close to, to touching, um, you know, what's going on at some of these lower levels on storage levels. Um, I think over, certainly over the past decade, um, in terms of high school curriculum and education in the area of digital preservation and digital curation, getting more hands-on and becoming a lot more versant, you know, at this level and layer, of technology um, has has gone up and deepened, for sure. But I mean, I'm wondering if you you know you just you think it we're approaching a time where it'd be in the interest to start exposing, you know, young professionals who are you know coming out into the field with a little bit lower level um, uh, competency and and uh, being a bit more versed with with configuring storage on some of these levels, and how to go about doing that. And again, anyone who, you know, sort of gets in the classroom these days or, you know, has an opportunity to work with young professionals, whether in like residency settings or whatnot, like what the value of that is. Are we reaching, you know, is it, would some of that be necessary moving in this direction? That may be very speculative. <laughs> I think in general, maybe myself, the more sort of uh, detailed technology that can be taught in um, high school, you know, MLS tech programs, the better. Um, I think it'd be hard to fit as much in, you know, as might be useful given, you know, they try to make these things 18 months, you can only do so much. Um, 
but I really might speak to uh, having strong relationships, you know, between those um, library school programs and other uh, programs in the university like IT. So if someone is trying to concentrate in digital curation, digital preservation, you know, that there's, hey, here are some, some systems administration and storage systems classes, you know, that you might be able to take to help that skill set build out. So what, what is the, what is the convert, I mean, to the degree that you're comfortable speaking to it, what is the conversation like there at Penn State, you know, as you try to bridge this, a deployment like this, or, you know, sort of create the environment for this to take off at your institution? What, what are the levels and sort of tenor of conversation between the libraries and, and your data centers? That's, <laughs> that's, that's a hard question, right? <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's a big problem, frankly. Um, but when I've talked about sort of the, the digital preservation management system, I would like us to build at Penn State, you know, that includes software defined storage. And those folks are, you know, generally like, you know, yes, of course, that makes sense. It's not problematic. It's more having problems with just, you know, they're seeing the elephant and not, not you know, the bite sized chunks. Um, and there's also, you know, sort of this big IT budget cut mandate that's come out. So sure. they, they see this as, oh, there's no way, you know, this could come off or take off. But, you know, I think if that's, then it falls to us to advocate higher up for, for resources outside of those um, budget cut streams um, to invest in these types of, this type of infrastructure. Um, but it, it's in, in abstract theory and concept, people are on board here, but they're, um, it'll be, a, it's a lot of work to, to build something, um, and I wouldn't necessarily want to build a production system out of the gate, you know, doing this unless we've had lots of conversations with the Stanford as they're doing it um, and other organizations, you know, it, it, because it is preservation, you know, we sort of need some more community testing of the model and some of these sort of prototype systems, um, you know, are, are the things that I'm saying, you know, that these are going to make it better and easier, are they going to hold true? Um, so there, there's a little bit of um, uh, cart and horse as well as the resource issue as well going on. Sure, that's great. And I appreciate you being uh, candid and upfront. Sure, do you want to take a risk? So are there, uh, we've got a few more minutes yet. Any, uh, any further questions from folks on the call? No. Okay. Um, well, with that, um, so Nathan, just want to uh, thank you for for putting this together. Um, really, really um, fresh and and revealing. And um, uh, I think what I'll do, uh, you've touched on Stanford's presentation um, that we've had um, towards the end of last year, um, and there was a there was a great presentation on uh, advocacy as well um, that was given. So I think uh, we'll bundle those up along with the recording from this one and and push those out. Um, I think to some degree they're kind of a piece based on some of the things that that you've shared and, and that we focused on in the conversation here. Um, we'll get those those sent out uh, later on this week. Um, if folks don't have any other questions, I'll just uh, tip folks to the, the fact that our, our next uh, conversation will be um, uh, on April 20th and we're going to hear from Courtney Mona on um, how to uh, translate the, the levels of preservation to uh, to storage architectures and how we, um, and I don't see Courtney on the line here any further, um, or I'd have her, you know, go ahead and say a few words about this just to kind of to preview what we're going to hear. Um, but I think her interest is in talking about how we how we assign storage and configure storage to handle different classes of content um, uh, in, in context of the levels of preservation um, that have come out most recently. So um, stay tuned for that. And other than that, we'll let folks go. Everybody stay healthy, stay well, um, and, uh, and we'll keep up with each other over the course of the month and look ahead to, uh, to April to, to catch up with each other again. Thanks. Thanks, Matt. Thank Bye. you. Stay safe. Yeah, you too.